insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 103, Something About Obi-Wan. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my comforting and caring co-host, Michelle Whalen. Aww. And why are you comforting and caring, dear? I don't know. Why? Because, oh, because of last Friday. Because last Friday, <sighs> we had a, an incident. Yep, we did. Had to go to the hospital for a little... Uh, medical issue i had and you were my my pillar of support there you you <laughs> i was your comfort animal or you, your support you were my support animal yes you were <laughs> <clears throat> so you helped me keep things together well i'm so, glad thank you for that you're welcome um not talking about that today though we're putting that in the past because everything's going better now mm-hmm uh, so in today's episode we're going to talk in disney detective about going contactless at Walt Disney World with your iPhone. The Florida Governor DeSantis also is trying to, to uh, go with a no vaccine passports for the whole state, including the theme parks. Then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, will Liam Neeson wind up reprising his role as Qui-Gon or not in Obi-Wan, the series? And we also have cast announcements and dates for the new series, mm -hmm. uh, which starts filming, I think, April, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yep. Uh, then in our entertainment news, we will talk about what we do in the shadows, getting another spinoff. They're going to be haunting CW and HBO Max this time. And then we'll talk about a new national treasure show coming to Disney+. Plus. And obviously, we'll finish up with our insightful picks, and we have a couple of afterthoughts. Yep. Uh, so stick around at the end of the show for a couple of uh, announcements that might signal a slight return to what we used to think of as normal life. Mm -hmm. Before we do that, though, I would invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get video versions of the podcast listed as Insights into Things. You can get audio versions listed as Insights in Entertainment. You can find us on Google, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon, Pandora, any place you can get a podcast now. I would also invite folks to reach out to us, give us your feedback, tell us what you want us to talk about, what is what you don't want us to talk about. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. On Twitter, we are at insights underscore things. On Facebook, you can get us at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, we are at Insights Into Things, or you can get links to all those on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Shall we get into it? Sure. All right. Go for Disney Detective. So it seems Disney Magic Mobile options are now launching on Apple devices and how to get started uh, for a contact contactless Walt Disney World Park entry. Say that five times fast. So beginning today, guests at Walt Disney World will be able to enjoy a convenient and contactless new option for entering the park um, and doing other things around uh, the park as well. It'll be available on iPhone and Apple Watch, but it will be coming to other smart devices later on. Uh, Disney Magic Mobile Service is a fun, easy-to-use way for guests to experience the most magical place on Earth. The service is offered in addition to other options such as the Magic Bands, which are the colorful, colorful all-in-one bracelet, which will continue to be available, and also 
be introduced in even more colors, designs, and limited edition fan favorites in the future. So uh, the article talks about how you can even create a customized digital pass. So guests can create a Disney Magic Mobile pass through the My Disney Experience app and add it to your wallet app on your iPhone or digital wallet on other smart devices. And then you can customize your pass by choosing several different Disney themed designs uh, that animate that animate upon use. Um, there's even special designs for annual pass holders and DVC members. Um, and you can use it on multiple devices or on a single device. Uh, so you could s- share it with, uh, you know, options for for uh, family members to use. Um, so basically what you would do is to enter the park, you would simply hold your iPhone or Apple watch or other smart device near the access point when entering the park or using other available features like you would do with your magic band. So it basically would replace your, your magic band if you didn't already have one or didn't want to purchase a magic band, because as we had talked about before, the magic bands are no longer given free if you're a resort guest. You either have to use one that you've already used before or purchase a new one. So here's another option for guests, excuse me, to, to use. Obviously, it would link up um, with your park pass. And also, they're going to have another enhancement of it will also... Uh, sync up with uh, your Disney photo pass as well. So all of your photos, once they've been taken, would download right to your phone. So you wouldn't have to go in and, and manually update them. So they're, you know, making all these little, you know, advances to make it a, a much more seamless experience, it seems. All right, so I got a whole bunch of questions here. Okay, I don't know if I'm going to have the answers. <laughs> so I, I haven't, I haven't tried using it yet. <laughs> so, first question I have is: Is it just to get in the parks, or does it work like your magic band to get into your room as well? I believe it's going to be anything that you would normally use your magic band for. So, park entrance, resort room entrance, payment for. Okay. Things. What and the, so you mentioned that it works with PhotoPass. Can I use it to scan my PhotoPass in like I can with the Magic Band as well? Yes. So yeah, when, when you go yeah, up to the photographer, photo, yes. you have to scan your thing. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. So it works yes. for that as well. Okay. Yes. So this is basically a universal replacement for Magic Bands at this point. Right. Or if you don't have an iPhone or don't want to use your um smartphone you can get a regular room key and those room keys could be used for park entrance the room and for your charge as well so because i'm sure there's going to be people because i know when disney started going towards the my disney experience app and everything people were complaining because it was draining their battery right and a lot of people you know so when people had to pull up what their fast pass time was or something with that a lot of people were complaining about the battery you know on their phone going so Um, so what about um i just lost my train of thought now that's a train that's easily derailed these days i was gonna say that but you know I, Um, i didn't can't think of what I was going to ask. Next question I have was, it's not available for Android devices yet. Do they yet. have a time frame yet? They don't list anything as of yet, but at least they're going to be supporting it at some point because you can use the My Disney Experience app on all platforms. Okay. So. I remember what I was going to ask. Okay. Is it restricted? In any way to people that are resort guests or can anybody take advantage of this? It doesn't say that it's for one or the other. Okay. Because obviously we know resort guests, they were pushing everybody to have magic bands because it was your room key, it was your charge and everything else. But as a park guest staying someplace else, you could get a magic band. You weren't required to do it. So- Yes, you could. Now I'm I'm going to get technical here. I'm assuming <gasps> mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm assuming they haven't published any information on what 
average battery usage is using this app throughout the day at this point. Yeah, nothing. Because that would be an area of concern. Right. Because that's always something. <laughs> and y- you see everybody with their, you know, little battery backups to right. charge their phone, you know, throughout well, and the Disney day. Disney has been putting in charging stations around mm-hmm. the, the park right. as well. So. Right. And I think the last question I had was um, lost again. Well, yeah. Okay. I'm having one of those days today. <laughs> Oh, uh, it, it, does this play in any way into the facial recognition beta testing that they were doing in last week? It doesn't story? even talk about this because this article actually came from DisneyParks.com. So this was an official Disney where the article uh, that we talked about that was there. somebody that just happened to be there. So okay. fair point. Mm-hmm. Fair point. Uh, what else do we have in Disney Detective today? So in some other Florida news, staying on the, the southern east coast, um, it seems that the Florida governor moves to prevent the use of vaccine passports in the state of Florida, including at theme parks. So citing privacy concerns, Gov- uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis had said uh, earlier this week that he intends to block the use of COVID-19 vaccine passports in the state of Florida. In comments, he said it is completely unacceptable for either the government or the private sector to impose upon you the requirement that you show proof of vaccine to just simply be able to participate in normal society. He went on to specifically mention the park, saying, you want to go to a movie theater? You should have to show that. No. You want to go to a game or a theme park? No. So we're not supportive of that. He um, says that he plans to use executive actions to ban their use in Florida. Vaccine passports are obviously gaining widespread attention worldwide as they are seen as a way to enable safer levels of transportation and attendance at events. Disney has yet to make any official comment on whether it plans to attempt to use vaccine passports as a part of its future policies at Walt Disney World. Meanwhile, at the White House, senior advisor for COVID-19 response uh, had said the government here is not viewing its role as the place to create a passport, nor a place to hold the data of citizens. We view this as something that the private sector is doing and will do. I think it's a little premature at this point since a vaccine passport doesn't even exist. Right. So to ban something that doesn't exist is kind of <laughs> it's silly. It's kind of silly. Um, and when it does exist, you have no idea what's going to be on there. Like, for instance, right. uh, we both have our shots at this point mm-hmm. in time. We have a card from the CDC, mm-hmm. and that card has information on there about the batch ID, the location, all that stuff. So there is – Personally identifiable information right, associated with that. there's something out there. So right. that wouldn't be a very good passport. But a passport that you you take that card and get a button, for instance. Mm-hmm. You know, your button could be – your passport could be as simple as a button like you had purchased for us right. that says, I'm vaccinated. Right. Would that offend you to have to wear something like that to get into the theme park? No. It wouldn't offend me at all, yeah. you know, and and this is something that we're starting to see now as travel and other things are, are starting to to reopen cruise lines as a as a we'll, we'll go with that. I have a friend of mine who happens to be a travel agent and an avid traveler and has not done anything Um and she has now booked a cruise, and I don't remember which yeah, company it was. Wouldn't be booking a cruise at this point. But it happens to be a cruise where you have to show proof that you've been vaccinated to go on the cruise. Masks are required in any public area. If you're outside, they you know will make sure that chairs are spread out in the dining areas. Things will still be spread out. And it lists all the places that you are required to wear a mask and where you, where it's optional. See, and that's sort of the problem that I have here is that <clears throat> the theme parks. All right, let's mm-hmm. just stick to the theme parks right. for a minute. The theme parks are a private property. Mm-hmm. 
They're not owned by the government. Right. Absolutely. The government can't tell you how to behave Mm -mm. on it. Disney has the ability to say what you can and can't do, how you must dress. Absolutely. You know, there are very strict guidelines on what you can wear going into mm-hmm. the theme parks. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So in order to use their facilities and enter their park, Disney's well within its rights to say you have to be vaccinated to come in here. And, and, and if, you have to show proof of right. it. Right. And if Disney decided tomorrow to do that, I would be okay with that. And, and I would too. And the government, you know, the governor of right. Florida would have absolutely no say over right. that. Right. Exactly. Because again, it's the private sector. It's just like how stores have, you know, even though certain states now have said you don't need to wear a mask, it's not mandatory anymore. But stores that are within Just like those a store states, can require that you wear right. shoes and a shirt to come right. into it. And there are and there are corporate stores that have said no matter what state it's in, you still need to yeah. wear a mask. We don't we don't want to, you know, this whole thing strike strikes me as turning the whole COVID thing into another political. Absolutely. You know, pivot point mm-hmm. here that someone's going to try and prove their point that mm-hmm. they're, you know, not like like I have a right to not be vaccinated. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's such an idiotic. Well, and concept. And that's the thing is that Krispy Kreme, the the donuts. <laughs> I don't think we actually have one nearby, or or maybe we do. They probably better if we didn't. <laughs> probably better. They actually had a, a thing that once you've gotten your shot, bring in your card and we'll give you a free donut. Yeah. Okay. So there also happened to be in our local area a gym yes. who back in last year got into trouble because when the, our state has shut down, he kept open right. and all these different citations or whatever. So now Krispy Kreme came out and said, hey, get a vaccine, get a free donut. He offered, don't get a vaccine and we'll give you a free membership to the gym and you don't have to wear a mask. Right. Which is just like, childish at this point. Right. Just exactly. Childish. That's... Like, at that point, you're part of the problem. You're not part right, of the solution. exactly. So here to say we're not going to require, like you said, it's not, it's up to each individual. Right, it's up to the company. Company to decide what they but want it, to do. To me, it's idiotic to ban something that doesn't even exist yet. Right. That is, you're just trying to win political points, you know, for a certain segment of the population. Right, right. And it's like, let's not make this public, all right? Right. Over a half a million people in the United States have died from this already. Let's try to take it a little more seriously. Mm -hmm. All right. (sighs) Rant over. And I wasn't ranting about Disney. See? Look at that. Wasn't ranting about (laughs) Disney that time. That's impressive. All right. Let's take a break and we'll come back with our uh, Tales from the Edge of the Other Side of the Galaxy thing. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. for tales from the other edge of the thing (laughs) from a long time ago Mm, far 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 away far away uh so it seems that liam neeson says that he would be up for returning to the franchise in obi-wan kenobi's disney plus series so it seems that he has expressed an interest in returning um as 
uh, Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn. And obviously we haven't seen him in the Star Wars franchise since the since episode one that came out in 1999. You wow. heard him, though. Wow. That, that is true. You did hear him. Um, so it uh, so it seems that he's, you know, again, interested if they wanted him to appear. Obviously, we know that Obi-Wan will be coming out. Um, Obi-Wan is obviously played by Ewan McGregor. He's reprising the role in the new series along with Anakin Skywalker, um, being played by Hayden Christensen as well. Um, when asked about the calls from Star Wars fans to bring back the character of Qui-Gon, he had said, I'll be honest with you, I haven't heard, you know, heard that at all. So after being assured that, yes, there was a demand for fan from fans for him to return, he'd said, sure, I'll be up for that. Obviously, if you've seen the movie, you know that his character was killed at the end of Phantom Menace. Um, but he obviously came back as a force ghost, which obviously left the door open for the character to come back in some sort of form. Um, in that same interview, uh, the actor expressed doubt about the future of the Star Wars franchise, saying, I'm sort of wondering, Star Wa uh, is Star Wars starting to fade away from the cinema landscape? Hmm. Probably not. <laughs> I know that that just makes me think he actually saw the the sequel well, trilogies. Well, maybe that's the thing. Maybe he saw. Um. So obviously we have Obi Wan uh, Kenobi coming out, and obviously other Disney uh, Star Wars projects. Uh, the third season of The Mandalorian, the Boba Fett spinoff, um, and obviously you know. Other things that we know, uh, the Bad Batch. I think there was a trailer, trailer or something today, yeah. for that too. So obviously Disney's not going, or Disney's not going. Star Wars isn't going away. Maybe it's not going to be as cinematic as you know. Maybe that was kind of where he he was going with it. But you know, spe talking specifically to him reprising <clears throat> his role, uh, it's worth noting. That Darth Maul got cut in half, and they brought him back too. True, so true. There's nothing to say that we can't bring him back. It, it's kind of like with soap operas. Just because they die doesn't mean they exactly. <laughs> they're exactly. not dead forever. <laughs> um, Qui Gon learned the secret of turning into a uh, Force ghost, and has passed that along. So I think that was significant. But I could totally see. Obi-Wan out in the middle of the desert living by himself there having hallucinations at least. Right, right. You know, I can see that. He might not actually be there. Right. Uh, but he might think he's there. I mean, True. You know, Obi-Wan had forced ghost appearances after he died too. Right. True. Uh, so there's no reason for that. Yeah. So. But to, to his point about, you know, Star Wars, I think, I think Star Wars, I think Disney learned a major lesson trying to flood the market with Star mm -hmm. Wars movies. Yeah. Like they tried to recreate, we've talked about this in the past. Yeah. They tried yeah. to recreate that Marvel cinematic universe with a movie coming out every few months and found that you can't do that with Star Wars. It just, it doesn't work. Well, right. when you make terrible movies, it doesn't work. If you they make good movies, if you they make Rogue One level movies every time, it they will They haven't work. found their niche yet because with Marvel, they're doing different characters in right, so many right. of the and, things. And, you know, in all fairness, Marvel had a couple stinkers in there, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, Iron Man 2 was terrible, and all the Hulk movies were horrible, and pretty much all the Thor movies were horrible. It was the, it was the movies where they were all together that was really good. <laughs> all the assembled movies. <laughs> right, right. Once they've been assembled, it's okay. Some assembly required. You need to go to Ikea and get your Allen wrench. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, I think he makes a point that, uh, Star Wars has kind of found its niche in television yeah. in, in serial form at this point yeah. in time. And it's not the first time. I mean, right. you know, you had your Clone Wars, you had your mm -hmm. Rebels, you had, uh, what was that other one that nobody liked? Resistance or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You know, they've, they've had their, their run in, in animation Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they surprised a lot of people with their live action. Right. And it's really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. So as a Star Wars fan myself, I'm perfectly happy getting my snippets of the Star Wars mm -hmm. universe that way and then doing a Star Wars movie as long as it's not directed by Ryan Johnson. 
That's your only prerequisite. <laughs> I'll, I'll be perfectly honest. I'm very excited to see what Taika Waititi comes out with oh, for gosh. his movie. That That's going to be awesome. That has to be awesome because. Because he's awesome. Because he's awesome. <laughs> Speaking of awesome, we have more Obi-Wan news to talk about. Yeah. So it seems that they have now unveiled the cast for Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, so Disney Plus revealed the cast for the upcoming special event series that is set 10 years after the events of Star Wars Revenge of the Sith. So join, joining Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christian in the series are Moses Ingram, Joel Edg Edgerton, Bonnie Pleas, uh, Kumala, I'm gonna... Totally. Guess we should have rehearsed this. Probably uh, Rupert Friend, O'Shea Jackson Jr. Unfortunately, none of these names sound familiar, but maybe it's one of those things if I saw them, I would know who they are. Um, but no details on their actual characters had been given yet. Um, production, as you had mentioned, will begin in April. Um, the return of Hayden Christensen as Darth Vader in the new series was actually announced back in November, so we've known about that for a while. Um, Obi-Wan Kenobi will be directed by Deborah Cho, uh, whose credits include two episodes of The Mandalorian, has not yet actually given a premiere date. Obviously, we know things had gotten pushed back because of COVID, because I think they were originally supposed to be coming out within 2021, I think, when I they had first so, yeah. announced it. Obviously, if they're not even starting to film, we're probably looking at maybe a January 2022, Possibly. maybe? Possibly. So, we'll see. Depends on, on how quickly they rush it and any production issues they run right. into. Right, and, and Disney, what's nice with Disney is they don't like to have things all come out at the same time. They kind of like to... Well, that's how you milk your subscriptions, it. especially Absolutely. when you're increasing your rates on your subscriptions. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so obviously we know Which we'll I noticed have... we cleverly didn't cover. Increase in the uh, Disney Plus subscriptions. Because yeah, we pay for it annually. So, <laughs> yeah. so I didn't notice. We'll notice next whatever when, when the bill comes. Well, since we're not going to the parks and getting an increase in a park True. Uh, tickets, we got to give it to Disney somehow. Right? right. And I get Disney dollars. So technically, it's I'm not paying for it. That's really all that some, matters. Right? Some respect, I guess. Yeah, so we'll obviously, as they start filming, we'll obviously probably hear more in terms of dates as, as things come. Right. And I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. I, like, just like you, I'm not familiar uh, with a lot of the cast that they announced, mm -hmm. but that actually kind of interests me. Yes. Because one of the things that Star Wars really did well in its very early in mm -hmm. in, uh, inception right. was bringing people bringing the talents of people out that were largely unfamiliar to audiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, they did that again with, um, uh, to a certain extent, they did it with uh, Solo. Mm -hmm. They did it with um, uh, Rogue One. Mm -hmm. uh, they, to a certain extent, they did it with Mandalorian. So it's one of those things right. where they, they kind of that, have That's this, kind of their thing. Yeah, it's at, that's their thing. And they've done a very good job. I'd much rather see that. I also did see... Um, is it Russell Crowe signed on? I have to look up the article, but I just saw Russell Crowe signed on to one of the shows that we liked. So, oh, okay. Um, they do, um, I'd rather see that than to see a whole bunch of people that, that are big name stars mm -hmm. who are fighting for attention and, and, and competing because mm -hmm. you don't, a lot of times you don't get the kind of selfless dynamic that you would expect to see from from the kind of show that we look for. Right, right. So anyway, very much looking forward to that. And that was all we had for our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. That's Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm fried today. It's a good thing it's a long weekend. For um, some. <laughs> don't be jealous. I'm not. Uh, you we'll still be, owe me a vacation day. We, I do. I know. I, I stole yours <laughs> last week. Yeah. Uh, I'll do your job tomorrow for you. How's that? Okay. You might not have a job on Monday if I do, though. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that's it for Tales from the Edge of Galaxy. We'll be right back with our entertainment news. In 
Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com on the web at insightsintothings.com. Dum, 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 dum. Go for entertainment news. So it seems what we do in the shadows is getting a spinoff that will land on the CW and HBO Max. So the broadcast network will get its first airings of a Wellington paranormal from Taika Watiti and Jermaine uh, uh, Clement. So the world of what we do in the shadows is now expanding. So the CW and HBO Max have jointly acquired Wellington Paranormal, a spinoff of the 2014 vampire mockumentary, which also spawned the FX series What We Do in the Shadows. The show is the first joint acquisition uh, uh, by the two outlets. HBO Max is the parent company of Warner Brothers, uh, Warner Media, which jointly owns the CW with Viacom CBS. So under the agreement... The CW will get the first airings of the show, which is set to be part of its summer schedule. A premiere date has yet to be determined. And then HBO Max will stream the episodes a day after the broadcast debut, uh, as will the broadcaster's ad-supported streaming platforms. Uh, So HBO Max has a full season of streaming rights of some other CW original series, including Batwoman, Nancy Drew... Uh, Walker, um, Superman and Lois, uh, Kung Fu and the Republic of Sarah, which they'll be airing um, as well after it airs on the CW. Um, Wellington Paranormal stars two of the stars who were part of the original film, and they'll be reprising their roles. They actually played um, two hardworking members of the Wellington New Zealand Paranormal Unit, Under the leadership of uh, the sergeant, uh, the unit investigates the surprisingly regular supernatural occurrences in the city capital. Um, They had uh, Clement and Watiti uh, had created the series with executive producer Paul Yates. Um, The New Zealand documentary board produces the series, actually. Um, So it's funny. I don't remember who these two characters were because it's been so long since we saw the original movie, but they were kind of like... I think we're very show-centric now that the movie's kind of... Right, that the movie... We kind of have to, like, go back and watch. So I think it was one of those things where these were kind of like two police officers that were kind of walking around and there was something going on they were like oh yeah that happens all the time or you know so it's it'll probably be a good thing maybe for us to go back and watch the the original movie to kind of refresh oh absolutely to kind of refresh ourselves so you know here's another spin on on it and obviously this will take place because the television series takes place in new york right and uh, so this part will actually take place in New Zealand more than likely. So should be and, interesting. And again, it's it's another project from Taika Waititi. So it's going to be. So awesome. we know it's going to be hysterical. So yeah, it can't help but you know <laughs> be awesome. And the show itself is great too. I can't mm-hmm. wait for the show to come back. Yeah, too. yeah. Tell us about National Treasure. So fans who have been, you know, looking for clues about the future of National Treasure are in luck. Deadline is reporting that Disney Plus has green-lighted a new TV spinoff series with an order for 10 episodes. The new series 
will hand the reins of the expanding expansion of the action adventure franchise over to a new Latina lead um, named Jesse Morales. The 20 year old dreamer Jess, along with her friends, will become involved in a new adventure revolving around the mysteries of her family tree while discovering some hidden treasure along the way. You'll recall that Disney Plus uh, series had been in the works uh, for the streaming service now. Um, There was actually news about this last May that was kind of teased because uh, the franchise producer, Jerry Bruckheimer, had said that they were actually looking at doing a third movie, but they were also looking at doing a television series as well. He had said, we're certainly working on one for streaming and we're working on one for the big screen. So hopefully they'll both come together and we'll be bringing another national treasure um, to, you know, to both screens. So from what they were talking about, the theatrical version will reprise the cast from the original movies, but the television series will actually be a much younger cast going on different adventures. Um, so I don't think they had, yeah, there's no confirmed dates yet. Um, but obviously more will be coming out, you know, as, as it becomes, as you know, they start filming and, and whatnot. So. So, and I see this as good news because they're fixing the one, Single biggest problem. <laughs> I knew you were going to go there. That I think the movies had. Because the movies were actually pretty good, but they had Nicolas Cage. So by pulling Nicolas Cage out and putting literally anybody, anybody else. else in there. Well, it sounds it'll like it, it, it it'll be almost like um, a young adult version. Oh, like a young Indiana Jones. Because that kind series of. went well. I like that. It didn't last very long. And Whatever. We know what happened to the star of it. Well, yeah. Anyway, uh, but, so hopefully yeah. it's better than that. Right. So it, it, it kind of sounds better. like that's, you know, where it, it's they're not going to be on the same journey or looking for the same items, but this well, kind of yeah, the same. They already found the other items. Right. They already. Right. Gotcha. So you don't need to find them again. Right. 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 So they already you know, know where it is. Why is it the last place you look is a place where you find it? Well, because you don't keep looking after you find it. Right. So it's got to be the last place. Anyway, I think that was it for our entertainment news and for my poor attempt at a comedy sketch here. (laughs) Uh, We'll be right back with our insightful picks. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick happened to be something that I came across on Disney+. Plus. Um, As we've mentioned before, our daughter and I, we have our TV time every night where we would watch uh, different movies, different TV shows. We actually had just finished um, Dinosaurs, the series from the the late 90s or the early 90s, I should say. Uh, so that we, we just finished up the other day and I was looking for something else to find and I saw this, you know, uh, show and I was like, hmm, let, let's start watching it. Um, and it's called The Secret of Sulphur Springs. It's streaming on Disney Plus, um, and it's an American horror mystery television series. It actually premiered in January of 2021. The series is set in fic- in a fictional Louisiana town of Sulphur Springs. So after his dad gets a new job, 12-year-old Griffin Campbell moves into the closed town uh, the closed down and dilapidated Tremont uh, Hotel in Sulphur Springs, Louisiana, which is supposedly haunted by Savannah Dillon, a camper at the ho- uh, at the Tremont camp who disappeared 30 years ago. With his new best friend Harper from his school, Griffin discovers a portal which takes the two back in time 30 years to 1990. I think that was the... That's so long ago. <laughs> that was the part that kind of killed me. I'm like, they're going back to 1990? That was 30 years ago? Oh. Um, and when they do that, they um, they meet and find out what's happening to Savannah Dillon and try, and try and save her from disappearing. It's kind of reminiscent of... Um, the different, like, Nickelodeon... 
mystery shows that the the you know the little goosebumps Goose and um who's afraid of the dark or are you afraid of the dark that kind of thing so wasn't sure if if our daughter was gonna like it because she's not really into the the horror or the mystery thing but it's not too over the top um you know and it's definitely more mystery like you find out that not everything you know what the parents said happened didn't really happen everybody kind of has a secret um so she's really enjoying it which is nice and it's something you know different out of the norm for what we would normally watch so probably meant for a little bit older you know teenage you know 10 11 um you know as long as they're not afraid of spooky sounds or, or whatnot but half hour episodes i want to say there's maybe eight or nine episodes uh to the season no word if this is like a one and done um but we're we're definitely enjoying it and the one thing was on disneynow.com they actually have little snippets that you can watch after each episode where they have cast members talking about what had happened on the show and their theories about what's going uh, forward in in the next episode so a nice little add on uh for for those watching the show cool nice pick thank you So my pick this week is a pick that is a documentary on Hulu uh, called Back in Time. We're big fans of uh, Back to the Future. We recently had our daughter watch the mm -hmm. trilogy there, and she liked it too. So Back in Time is an amazing look at the immense cultural impact of the Back to the Future trilogy 30 years. And so this is kind of <laughs> – this is a – 1990. <laughs> this is a 2015 documentary okay. so it's a few years old um uh so it's a, a look at the cultural impact of the back to the future trilogy 30 years after mcfly and brown went on an epic adventure a look at the very real impact the back to the future movies have had on our culture what was uh once a little idea that spawned a tightly focused documentary has grown into something truly amazing over two years of filming Back in Time is a cinematic monument to the vastness of the trilogy's fandom. In addition to the footage and interviews revolving around the time machine itself, the DeLorean, the crew found that simply by delving into the impact of the trilogy, an epic journey began to unfold before them. So the documentary itself was something that they start out almost like a fan project, like a, like okay. a Kickstarter back fan project thing to, to put something together. And that turned into a, a monumental journey. Um, the crew captured countless hours of footage during filming from Steven Spielberg to Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale to the Shays and Hollers and from uh, James Tolkien and Leah Thompson to Christopher Lloyd and Michael J. Fa Fox back in time features interviews after interview that simply must be seen. And and that's kind of what blew my mind is they had such access to all the stars. They would go to fan conventions that happen across the, the world, really. Okay. Because the, the one that they did was down in, I think, Australia. And they would talk to um, the people that attend these. And, you know, they went not just Back to the Future – um, conventions, they went to DeLorean conventions. Oh, okay. <laughs> and they talked to people like the community itself of people that buy the roughly 3,000 DeLoreans that survive mm -hmm. and try to turn them into uh, okay. time machines. Okay, okay. And they talked to this one husband and wife who actually were volunteers for the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Mm -hmm. And the husband had been diagnosed. He was given six months to live. Um, and they decided that they wanted to buy a DeLorean. He, he, that was his bucket list. He wanted his DeLorean and wanted to turn it into a time machine. And like eight years later, the man is still going because wow. of the passion of, of what that project did huh. for them. Um, they've driven the, on a, they were, had a mission once they built this DeLorean to drive it to all 50 states, which they've accomplished doing. Hmm. And they've raised countless amounts of money for the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's. And it was just, just their story alone 
would have made the documentary worth it. Mm -hmm. But they go they go into all the festivals that happen. Like okay. there's there's one that was in uh, New Zealand where they recreate the town. Oh wow. Uh, complete with the houses. So you walk through Biff Tannen's house and each person's house. And, huh. and it's neat because when you park, you park out in the parking lot. And when you walk through, they create a Peabody's farm. And you walk through the farm and they have farm animals and everything. And then you come into the town square oh, and wow. they everyone watched the movie in the town square. And they did a play. It was, it was really well done. It hmm. was, it was uh, not your typical type of documentary. But the thing that really gave it the gravitas was the fact that you had people like Michael J. Fox featured in here, Leah Thompson, Christopher Lloyd, Robert Zemeckis. They were all – they all made time. To be part of – No pun intended. <laughs> but to be a part of this documentary. Mm -hmm. And it was a really well done documentary. Totally blew my mind. Hmm. So Back in Time is streaming now on Hulu. We'll be right back with some afterthoughts. So where are we going? So obviously we know that um, San Diego Comic Con is still going to be virtual uh, this year. But one of the little uh, conventions that is usually in our area, uh, Monster Mania, they usually hold it twice a year. Um, they are doing something a little different uh, this year. They are doing Monster Mania's mini little mall of horrors. Um, they're actually doing it at a different location than they normally do. It's actually going to be in Oaks, Pennsylvania at the um, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania uh, Expo Center. Um, and this is actually a location that we've gone to for other different events. But what's neat about this is not only is it going to be a little um shopping center is they're also going to have some celebrities there so it's kind of like a, a miniature uh convention um tickets are just 13 dollars a day as of right now saturday is completely sold out they are limiting the amount of people uh you do have to buy your tickets in advance obviously social distancing uh is uh is asked and masks are required. Um, it's the first time ever that they're doing this little outdoor mall of horrors. Um, and they're doing it on Saturday, May 22nd and Sunday, May 23rd. They will have over 150 vendors in a large six acre paved fairground. Vendors have been waiting since March of last year to, to do any sort of show. So this is kind of going to be, uh, interesting, different, um, kind of an outside version. Uh, normally Monster Mania is held in one of the local hotels in Cherry Hill, and it's usually very packed and very crowded. Um, so it'll be interesting to kind of see how, how this goes. Uh, we did buy tickets because we're, we're Jones in for That's something. That's where we get to a convention. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, usually it's a convention that we go to not necessarily to see any of the celebrities, usually to, you know, walk around and just be among other people. So we did buy tickets already. So it should be interesting to see, you know, maybe we'll we'll film some of it, um, you know, for, for a later show. Uh, and maybe depending on how successful this is, maybe it'll be something they continue to do, uh, you know, a couple times a year. So we'll see. What else we got? So another thing that kind of popped up was obviously we see a lot of bands that have been um, coming out and doing online concerts, uh, different streaming events. Uh, but this was one that that popped up. Um, Bare Naked Ladies is going to be doing a little uh, concert. Uh, it's actually it's not a full a uh, full concert. It's actually uh, going to be just an hour and they're calling it flipping hits with uh, BNL, a night of monster jams of a pandemic proportions. It's a streaming event. That's only going to be played once. They're not going to be doing any um, post broadcast viewing of it. It'll be a 60 minute greatest hits concert uh, that they um, filmed in Toronto. What's nice about it, though, is they have a whole bunch of different ticket prices, and the cheapest one is actually $15. So really not that 
not that expensive. Um, I think there was one that was $30 that included a copy of their greatest hit CD along with a ticket to the show. Um, so the concert is going to be on April 17th at nine o'clock. So if anybody is a Bare Naked Ladies fan and you're looking for a, a concert, obviously not to go to because, again, you know, everybody's social distancing, at least you can get some sort of music entertainment. Nice. Nice. So a couple of little things that might be signaling a little bit mm -hmm. of return to normalcy here. Yeah. And uh, we've got, uh, what, was the, what was the other convention that was coming up that they were splitting? Well, that was... San Diego, where right. they were going to be doing the virtual, and then they're doing, and then possibly later. something, yeah. and then supposedly the summer ZoloCon is supposed to be, which ZoloCon usually for our area usually would be in um, February. They're looking at a July date, so so we'll see, we'll see. And I think what what you're going to see is for any of the conventions or any of the the shows. Kind of like with anything else, you're going to have to buy your ticket in advance. You're going to have to buy it so ahead a of bit, time. A little bit more planning, a little bit more prep. Right. You're not going to be able to just the day of, hey, let me go and see. They're not going to let people in or they'll do time tickets, you know, so that not everybody is coming in. So you'll probably see that you know, for the, nice. the next little while. But at least it's something. We're getting so there, So we're right? getting there. We're getting there. And I think that was all we had today. Mm -hmm. um, before we go, I would ask folks once again to subscribe to the podcast. If you subscribe, you'll get it first thing Monday morning at 8 when they go live. You can get us the – you can get the uh, video versions of our podcast. If you look up uh, Insights into Things, you'll get the video versions of all the network's podcasts. Audio versions of this podcast you can find under Insights into Entertainment. We're on Apple, Spotify, Google, any place you can get a podcast. Uh, and we also, you know, again, ask you to reach out to us. Give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We stream six days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. The audio versions of this podcast can be found at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. You can find us on Instagram at instagram.com backslash insights into things. High res versions of our videos can be found on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. And you can find us on the web with links to everything for all of our different podcasts at insights into things.com. That's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.